Welcome, everyone. We're just uh, giving it a, a minute grace period while we wait for more folks to join, and hopefully everyone's able to navigate the technology and hear us clearly today. So we'll just give it another uh, 30 seconds and then jump in. Okay, in respect of the time uh, of the people who have joined already, we'll, we'll go ahead and jump in and get started. And we're really excited to do that. So again, welcome everyone. We're really delighted that you took time out of your day to join us for this important conversation. My name is Joe Doherty. I'm a partner at Dahlberg Advisors uh, based in Oakland, California. And our conversation today, Beyond Racial Backlash, the role of funders, intermediaries, and practitioners in forging ahead together, is fundamentally about risk, the risk we face in our current environment and the risks we need to take and manage together in order to change systems. We're all aware of the backlash against racial justice that's been pushed in different spheres of American public life, in school boards, libraries, legislatures, and most importantly, in philanthropy. For many of you who've worked in the racial justice space for a long time, these attacks sadly come as no surprise. In our work at Dahlberg and at Common Future, we're seeing very different responses across the spectrum. Most importantly, funding for racial justice work has declined substantially over the past few years and now falls well below the level of commitment that was promised uh, back in the wake of George Floyd's murder. Many funders and practitioners have backed away from racial justice work entirely. Others have gone into a sort of stealth mode and a brave few have actually doubled down and are expanding and becoming even more explicit about their racial uh, their work on behalf of racial equity. So this variety of responses and the dissonance among them prompted Dahlberg and Common Future to initiate a series of small anonymous roundtable conversations with actors across the racial justice landscape, practitioners, intermediaries, and funders to cut through this noise and hear how our partners are actually experiencing this moment, what's on their mind, what's keeping them up at night, what innovative tactics are they trying to, to move things forward, and to be part of that collective effort that shifts funders and fields in the right direction. So in our last set, or since our last set of conversations, the environment seems to be getting even worse and the stakes even higher. So today's presentation brings out the insights from the conversations we've had over the past <clears throat> a few months and dives into the challenges we're seeing in this environment and hopefully gets us to some proposed solutions to try out on how we can coordinate with each other across the, the value stream, if you will, of racial justice work um, to forge a stronger and more effective response. So the panel that follows in just a minute will bring press perspectives from practitioners, intermediaries, and funders to react and reflect on these findings and think about ways in which coordination can really happen in practice. So finally, today's seminar or webinar, as I said, centers on risk. Funders, practitioners, intermediaries, all of us are keenly aware of the risks around us. And many of those risks, although I would argue maybe not all of them, of the risks that we perceive are real. But on the other hand, it's been said that philanthropy should serve as society's risk capital. In other words, the purpose of philanthropy is to take risks that others won't. Jeff Rakes, when he was head of the Gates Foundation, once mused publicly how he could encourage his program officers to take on more risks. So the question before us today is how can we work together to best address this moment, manage risks strategically and thoughtfully, and ultimately overcome the backlash? So I'll now pass on to two of Common Future's co-CEOs, Jennifer Njaguna and Jess Yupanki feingold to share about the challenges and opportunities we have before us. And again, welcome everyone, and thanks very much for joining us today. Over to you, Jennifer and Jess. You're on mute. Thank you, Joe, um, for that introduction and for that overview. I'm hoping you all can see the slides now. Um, and as Joe has shared, a lot of this has been an act of documentation, of triangulation. I think when we and Dahlberg went into this endeavor, we knew that there were trends that we were seeing, 
But we needed to really come together, come together in an anonymous space to be able to have the needed conversations and share back a little bit more today of what we're witnessing, what we're seeing. Um, again, together as a, in coalition, as funders, intermediaries, and practitioners, we're all pulling together. And this is an opportunity for us to really hold that space for those conversations, those much needed conversations. And so a quick overview of our agenda for today. Um, we will get into a brief presentation. Jennifer Njaguna and I, two co-CEOs at Common Future, will share a bit on the takeaways from those conversations. We'll move into our facilitated panel, leave some time for Q&A, and then close um, at the 2.30 Eastern, 11.30 Pacific hour. So again, I spoke a little bit to how these conversations got started and the act of seeing, witnessing, documenting, triangulating. And just to give name and a little bit of framework to the external environment we're seeing, we are seeing legal challenges and narrative distortions. Um, this should be no surprise to you over the last year, at the very least, the anti-DEI backlash, specifically after the Fearless Fund decision and the overturning of affirmative action, is really a part of a broader conservative assault against various types of race-based initiatives. Conservative forces have taken and co-opted uh, narratives around DEI and have pushed many of us who self-define as racial justice advocates and allies into debates about DEI, which have driven us much to distraction. Um, in these debates, in this um, calculated backlash, um, is obscuring the true problems that we actually um, seek to address around white supremacy and the racialized roots of our capitalist system and really sets the stage for authoritarianism. And so we're seeing this on many levels play out um, in the media and in the conversations today. For centuries, there's been tactics like co-opting narratives of reverse discrimination and that is a topic that is rearing its ugly head once again. Reverse discrimination has been used to uphold white supremacy and racial capitalism as well. In times of economic and social crises, these narratives tend to trend and gain traction, scapegoating black and brown communities and obscure who the true villains are, white supremacy, capitalism, and corporate domination. So this is a little about what we're seeing. And internally, within our sector, within our space, um, we are witnessing what a lot of us are calling a chilling effect from with the social impact space. Um, particularly, this comes in the form of funders pulling back support for racial justice and stated commitments they made in 2020 and 2021 um, following the death of George Floyd and the rise of the relevance and critical importance of many of these issues to the national attention. Um, there has been a strong consensus in our conversations among practitioners, intermediaries, and funders alike. There's a lot of broken commitments out there. Philanthropy became a really vocal supporter of racial justice, and since that period of time, many funders have walked back, some more publicly, some quietly. And it's this um, retreat that is really hurting leaders, particularly leaders of color, employees and our communities as we have to continue going back to the beginning to make the case once again for this work and make it in different ways. A lot of what we're seeing is funders, frankly, becoming more risk averse um, in response to the affirmative action ruling. Um, some are explicitly moving away from their support for racial justice. They are not the vocal advocates they once were. And this is hindering the progress made and also eroding it to some extent. Um, many practitioners and intermediaries are witnessing funders pull back that support in terms of funding. And some of the behaviors that we witnessed and uh, talked about together is requests for subtle shifts in language, for example, on grant requests. Um, others have increased scrutiny of our work, asking more questions, requiring more documentation. And overall, practitioners are perceiving a greater difficulty of securing funding. At the same time, there's a lot of program officers within philanthropy, particularly black program officers, are doing the most that they can and noticing internally that leadership tends to either shift their strategy or attention away or find reasons to back and support other issues at this time. Um, it really feels like a retreat on the whole. And so with the looming threat of losing funding and support for work that explicitly, very clearly supports racial justice, Practitioners and intermediaries like ourselves at Common Future 
have faced some pressure to water down our messages and potentially shift our strategies in order just to safeguard the work and keep money flowing into communities. Um, of our conversation, a lot of our participants consistently asserted the importance of precise and explicit language in the fight for racial justice. Others, however, expressed the need to pick one's battles and respond strategically to ensure that we can continue in this fight. That is one of the critical tensions that I'm seeing and feeling that we is impacting us in the work is that attention between how much to double down and be specific and precise how much to step into other frameworks that safeguard the work. There is no easy answer. This is a debate that is live, will continue to be so. All in all, even though there is a lot of tension and debate, there is something that most folks will agree on pretty readily. Um, the common theme is that we've had this conversation before. In fact, we've been having this for decades. And it's our opportunity to really break out of that cycle and reimagine the way we might respond in this particular moment. And from here, I'll pass it over to Jennifer and Jaguna to take us into what we can do about it. Great, thank you, Jess, for giving that overview of some of the things that we heard uh, throughout the various conversations that we had. Um, so now I'm gonna talk through what are the implications of this and, and how must we respond? Next slide, please. So I think the first thing for us to note is just that we are not alone. Um, you know, these pressures are are difficult and frustrating, and and sometimes we might feel like we are on our own as we navigate these challenges. But um, this community here, the groups that we spoke to, are just the strongest indication that we are in community together. And um, there is something about bringing that community together to be able to talk about the challenges, consider the trade-offs, and think about how we coordinate our action together. Next slide. The other consideration for us is really around how we think about resetting the narrative. Um, Jess talked about some of the defensive mechanisms that we've had to employ during this time, particularly around DEI, but we know that racialized capitalism is a problem, and we also know that a multiracial democracy and an equitable economy together are the solutions. And so the charge here for us is to not let the terms of this conversation be set merely around DEI. As you might recall, it was previously critical race theory or anti-woke, um, and any other, any other number of terms um, that could be easily co-opted. Um, so we must not let these or any others that are created going forward push us into defensive positions when we know the real cause of social and economic inequity excuse me, is white supremacy and racial capitalism. And I think relevant to that idea are the words of Toni Morrison, um, which are unfortunately as relevant now as when she first articulated this. Um, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says you have no art so you dredge that up. Somebody says you have no kingdom so you dredge that up. None of this is necessary there will always be one more thing. And so what's really critical here is just realizing the nature of distraction with a focus on DEI. We, we've even seen it emerge yet again in um, recent political conversations and um, it just keeps us having to be in response mode and not able to focus on the things that are critical, critical to creating the society that we want. It's crucial to recognize and name these dynamics in our narratives in order to safeguard the gains for racial justice and fight the rising threat of authoritarianism. By being precise about the challenges, including the distractions, we will be better positioned to advocate for solutions centered on Black and Indigenous and other communities and show how a racial, multiracial democracy and equitable economy has something to offer everyone. The other responses that came up were really around 
coordination. So almost all participants emphasize the need for more coordinated efforts across practitioners, intermediaries, and funders to align around shared goals and identify roles that each actor can play. So for example, some participants noted that they've had these conversations in funder circles, but that coordinated action requires a bigger tent. It requires us not being in eco chambers and really thinking about how we connect across stakeholders. This also entails an analysis of infrastructure gaps across the racial justice ecosystem. For example, one participant raised the importance of developing a state-by-state -state strategy. Conservatives have been mounting a state-level strategy for decades as evinced by a slew of recent state laws. What can we do to develop a more intentional strategy to build and connect state and other types of infrastructure? Another thing that came up was around securely sharing resources, particularly legal resources in the midst of an environment where there are increased lawsuits. How do we think about not reinventing the wheel and making sure others can benefit from the information and guidance that maybe a few of us have access to? Next slide, please. And so now, how do we think about each of the different stakeholders that we've spoken to. What are our respective roles? With respect to funders, there were some clear themes that emerged for actions that can be taken. First and foremost, we cannot afford to backtrack on funding for racial justice. At this moment, it's critical for funders to double down on this work and to be clear about that. More than just providing funding, Philanthropy must interrogate their internal structural practices and the practices across the field. Communities that we partner with and that many of our participants partner with have beautiful intersectional visions that recognize that racial justice is climate justice, is economic justice, is disability justice, is gender justice and more. However, the common approach of siloing funding areas and shifting focus from one to another restricts our ability to move forward as the united collective that we are. It's imperative for movement aligned funders to rethink these practices as they create false competition and deep instability that hinders progress, burns out leaders, and takes away from the central needs of communities. Taking these kinds of actions will help us build a big tent and be better equipped to coordinate. Now, more than ever, there is still a need for patient, multi-year general operating dollars so that organizations can strategize and operate from a resilient and financially sound position. We also heard from practitioners and intermediaries that funders must be willing to use not only their funding, but their power and privilege to openly advocate for racial justice and defend organizations from backlash and rising anti-Black racism. As actors with ample resources, you can take a courageous stand and have more of the resources needed if you must defend that stance. One example of that actually came from uh, MacArthur Foundation um, in a recent public statement where they are talking about how they're not going to let the Circuit Court of Appeals that ruled against the Fearless Fund guide their funding efforts. So there are plenty of examples out there that can be borrowed from as funders think about how they will use their privilege and power. Similarly, it's critical for funders to keep ringing the alarm, to draw attention to and inspire action against the backlash, especially among peer funders who may be backing away or concerned about risk. Right now, we have to recognize the greatest risk is backing down and not continuing forward with this work. For decision makers within philanthropy, you must take a critical and holistic approach to understanding risk so that you can assess your leverage rather than simply mitigate risk at all costs, especially in your legal and investment risk assessments. Traditional risk frameworks will often, if not always, discount people of color, especially Black and Indigenous communities. This might look like getting advice from general counsels and others, but then weighing that advice against other strategic and tactical decisions and priorities. For program officers and others who may not have direct decision-making power, 
you still play a critical role in the case making and raising the alarm to those who are decision makers. Continue leaning into your roles as case maker, narrative weaver, negotiator, storyteller. Continue to be transparent with grantees about elements of the internal environment you face, the insider scoop. Help grantees help you. We see how many of you are already doing that and just ask that you continue. And finally, facilitate introductions. Use social capital, an incredible resource that does not cost in dollars to help your grantees make other introductions. If there's work that you're not able to fund, perhaps you're connected to others who will, and you can make those introductions. Make introductions to others who are able and better equipped to use their privilege and power. Intermediaries. It's critical that intermediaries keep advocating for community partners. Funders are often looking to intermediaries to help connect dots and provide the case making needed to secure funding for racial justice work within philanthropic institutions. Helping to see and understand themes that emerge across different areas of programmatic work is really critical and intermediaries often play this role. Intermediaries should also use privilege Practitioners see intermediaries as a buffer between potentially arduous processes that funders might be putting into place as a result of legal counsel and guidance and are asking for intermediaries to use their influence and power to push back on these practices where they can and help them navigate this. And practitioners, continue to lift up what's happening. Practitioners are often closest to the challenges that communities face when funding for racial justice work is inconsistent and are being asked to, to continue to lift up the data and the stories to trusted partners, either intermediaries or in funding roles. Lean on peers to develop and test strategies together. While instances of backlash may feel individual, targeted, and siloed, the best response is found in collective strength. This is especially true and needed for practitioners who bear the highest direct accountability to communities and who daily weigh countless trade-offs. Having peers to reflect on these hard decisions is, is essential. And finally, practice organizational and individual self-care. Setting and modeling boundaries, explicitly talking about the harm that is experienced from systems and leaning on community are all useful practices to sustain this work especially as leaders. And now, what can we do together? There's the work that each of us do within our respective lanes from our different vantage points, but it's critical that we understand all the tools that we have available to us, not just the tools that we use day in, day, day in and day out, but tools that maybe we hadn't considered before. They might be analysis and narrative, so being clear about the why of what we're seeing happen and using that to provide historical context and to do the storytelling that's needed to reset the tone and the table. Economic and funding tools, thinking about what we invest in, what we fund, but also what we stop investing in and funding. Political advocacy and legal, I know this one is sometimes tricky and one that we tend to shy away from, um, particularly considering the IRS rules for 501c3s, but it is okay to engage in advocacy work. So make sure to take the time to better understand what this looks like for your organization so that it is a tool that you can tap into. And consider the different legal resources that are available um, and that you might be able to offensively use. Convening and organizing. This goes back to what I shared earlier about how we consider our coordination, how we think about the infrastructure that's needed and how we bring people together virtually in person to be in conversation and to be in relationship with one another. And then finally, social capital and networks. I can't underscore enough how important it is to think about this tool as a resource and make sure to share information, share contacts, share relationships, so that we can collectively create that bigger tent. Understand which ones you can and should use, and then stay hopeful 
and continue to take action. And we know this is just the start of this conversation, but we will now move into kicking off our panel discussion facilitated by my colleague, Allison. Please feel, to, please feel pre free to put any questions you have in the Q&A function for open discussion. All right, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you and Jess for the insights. Um, from your conversations and Joe for that very helpful grounding and overview. Um, hi everyone, I'm Allison, I'm the VP of Brand and Storytelling and we are going to jump right in to our conversation um, from our, our panel of experts who will share their insights and their um, expertise as well. So to kick us off, if you can start with your name, pronouns, organization, mission of your organization, and grounding us in these takeaways and helping to crystallize what this actually looks like, share a consequence of the backlash that you have witnessed. And we can start maybe with you, Reggie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, my name is Reggie Shuford. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the executive director of the North Carolina Justice Center. Uh, a statewide uh, nonprofit organization headquartered in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is also my home state. Uh, I've been in this position for just over a year and a half. Um, so I'm reacclimating to being back in the South. Um, and, uh, and it is interesting to be doing this work in this current moment uh, in particular. Um, in terms of a particular consequence, um, I guess I would start by first saying that everything that we've heard uh, to this point rings true. Um, I've either personally experienced uh, some of these issues, observed other people experience them, or certainly have heard about them. So all of it really resonates. I think in terms of a of one consequence um, that I would focus on um, in my own experience is um, I guess I wanna make explicit that link between um, underfunding, like the external racial justice work that many of our organizations do, um, making a link between underfunding internal race equity work and the implications that come from that underfunding. So I just wanna say like, the North Carolina Justice Center, like we are grateful for every grant that we get, for every dollar, like all of it makes a difference. And the overwhelming majority of our funders are sticking with us and they're showing up and they're 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 honoring their commitments to us. I'm, I'm gonna say that. Um, and more than one thing can be true, right? Um, and so I've also witnessed folks be reluctant to invest in work, uh, I guess that they don't consider quote unquote programmatic. Often that work looks like strategic planning or it looks like uh, racial equity, right? Like you name it, all critically important work with a direct impact on the external work, right? But because it's quote unquote not programmatic, their folks aren't always like uh, ready ready to support it. Um, and I think that comes with some consequences. Number one, I think is integrity and 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 how are we demanding uh, racial equity of the various stakeholders right out there? And internally, we are not able to kind of have those conversations or take a pause and do that work ourselves, right? So what credibility do we have? to be doing this advocacy, but internally, internally our how our own houses might might be a mess, right? Um and and so I think that's important. I think in terms of the role we occupy in a particular community, uh in a broader landscape, uh, reputation is critical and it certainly impacts the work. So we need to be able to do both things at once, the internal work as well as the external work. And then the final thing that I'll say in, with respect to this question is that underfunding this race equity work can also manifest as, un, as underfunding or not supporting leaders of color, right? Many of whom um, have been hired <laughs> since 2020 in these roles to fix all the things, right? 
Um, but to underfund that work, and in some sense, means not supporting the very leaders hired to fix all the things. And I am often reminded of this concept called the glass cliff, right? When women or leaders of color or women leaders of color are hired or succeed, um, uh, like a white um, executive director or CEO who's been perhaps who was in the position perhaps for a long time, uh, and then um, you know don't have the resource, have all these expectations on the one hand, but really don't have the resources or the networks um, to really do all the things that are asked of them. Um, and so that's a particular consequence that I, you know, have experienced uh, related to what we're talking about today. Thank you, Nadia. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Reggie. Um, I think what you've shared is just so critical. Um, and I'm excited to dive more deeply into that uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, my name is Sandhya Nakasi. I use she, her pronouns. My organization is Common Future. And our mission is to um, make an, equi ep an equi equitable economy, sorry, an equitable economy possible by investing in solutions that advance racial justice. And I actually had the privilege of being in all of the small group conversations leading up to today with practitioners, intermediaries, and funders uh, and want to lift up the, a sentiment that was really clearly heard across all three three conversations and one, one that's really live for me in terms of a consequence of this racial backlash. And really it is the amount of time that is being spent within our organizations and with our boards trying to decipher the language that we need to use to talk about this work that we know needs to happen and really just want to double down and like double click into that notion of this is this is people's time and resources and organizational resources that are being used and spent on trying to like massage wording rather than moving money and designing programming and, and supporting internal racial equity work that needs to happen. And that can is just like the amount of time if we had to calculate it would probably be remarkable and at the same time, so disheartening. This is money that is being siphoned away from actually being able to do the work we know needs to be done. And it feels like, you know, just, hearkening back to the Toni Morrison quote that, that Jennifer shared with us, we're stuck in this loop. We're stuck in this loop trying to explain ourselves, trying to massage the problem uh, so that other people can, can be comfortable about our work when we know we have to be explicit about our work, otherwise we won't be able to find the solutions. So really that is like a, a tremendous consequence that I heard and that I feel very deeply in my day to day um, when we are spending time trying to 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 reframe racial justice and racial equity work. And I'll pass it uh, over to you, Kate, to introduce yourself. Thank you. And yeah, just 100%, 100% of what Reggie just shared and what Sandia just shared. Uh, my name is Kate Fox. I use she, her pronouns. I work at the Center for Cultural Innovation. I run our Ambitious Initiative. Ambitious is a time-limited pooled fund that is shifting capital, power, and ownership to, uh, to cultural communities under threat. And for us, that means in particular Black and Indigenous communities, although not exclusively. And we do that by investing in economic trailblazers, um, and uh, really interesting experiments in artist ownership. Uh, Sandia, as you were talking about kind of the tyranny of the details and the massaging and the framing, that it, it just, it's so, I feel like it's so relevant because a lot of the work um, happens in negotiating funding relationships. 
um, and how we present the work and how we frame the work and how we do the work. And it also shows up in other kind of small, small things, but that become kind of daily tyrannies. And the, the, the piece that really struck me in the, um, in the opening presentation, which was great, by the way, thank you so much um, for having these conversations because people are having these conversations in tiny little places and we need to have a larger conversation so we can share our analysis. Anyway, this idea of philanthropy stepping back um, and the backlash uh, in, often internally, mostly borne by program officers and directors of color uh, was a predictable outcome because philanthropy has actually resisted um, significant internal systems change work itself, right? Um, and so we saw how they could release lots of money very quickly um, and reporting processes and proposal processes were often very reduced, um, um, helping, helping those of us on the receiving side actually be able to focus on the work. And we saw that those changes actually were possible, but they didn't last. And now we're stuck back in a lot of the um, a lot of the theory of change, negotiating these things as you suggested, massaging language, um, instead of really talking about revisiting PRI and MRI terms to subordinate the foundation's interests to those of communities. We are we are stuck writing three page reports, five page reports that I'm not sure anybody ever reads. And so, um, you know, it it is it is both. Um, there are both very significant consequences in being direct about who we are doing the work with. Um, and there are all these tiny, um, all these tiny consequences that end up, again, um, making us spend more time on the administrative part instead of really being able to focus and have meaningful conversations about how foundations can be accountable to the communities they say they wanna serve. So maybe I'll step off the, um, the soapbox there for a minute. Sorry, got kind of carried away. No, you're good, Kate, and, and very welcome um, insight there. I think you all, and you share your examples, you, you kind of touched on um, what we're gonna get at in the second question, which is this series is about redefining risk right? And challenging and changing the normalized assumptions we have about the economy, um, about our country, about the way that we work. And so how can we challenge or move away from risk aversion in your prospective um, positions in the ecosystem? What might that look like? And I don't want anybody to, to jump in there. Ooh, that's a, that's a good, that's a good question. <clears throat> so Thanks for asking a good question. It's challenging. Um, and I hope this answers it. <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm gonna make an analogy if I could. So in my first answer, I talked about the effect of uh, underfunding uh, this work on our colleagues, right? Um, and how demoralizing that can be with, along with uh, this current moment that we are living and operating in. Like, I won't speak for every uh, body, but certainly in North Carolina, uh, our usual strategies of uh, litigation, lobbying, et cetera, are meeting with some resistance. Our, the state legislature is not always so open to what we have to say and what we want. And the courts are becoming increasingly less receptive to some of our arguments too. So already folks are feeling like, I, I'm good at like, I'm a strong advocate. Like I'm really good at my job and, but nobody's responding to them anymore. Like, so they're feeling demoralized because of that too. And so what I said is we have to redefine what winning means in this moment. 
it might always might not always be the policy objective or outcome we're seeking, but are we holding the line and reducing harm just by being in the fight? It might not be the decision uh, in court that we want, but is it better than it might have otherwise been? Um, and so just like we need to redefine what winning and victory looks like in this moment, so too can we redefine what risk is. And I think it's essential that we do. Um, and, you know, that can be a function of organizational culture. It could be a function of what the external environment looks like. It can be a function of the individual leader. Like, is your CEO, am I risk averse, right? And so depending on who you are and how you show up, it, like, it might mean pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone and with in whatever capacity you serve, as a funder, as an interme intermediary, as a practitioner, pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone, taking up some space, naming the thing, um, and saying that the times call for a different approach. Like we don't have the luxury of kind of sitting back and doing the things we used to be, or taking fewer risks, like we perhaps are more comfortable doing. Like we have to do different, we have to do better, we have to do more. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I guess I'll, I guess I'll stop there for now. Yeah, Reggie, what you shared, um, I feel like is a call to all of us to step up. Um, and push ourselves. And, and I, I feel like it goes kind of hand in hand with, um, with what I was thinking about in terms of the, the role of intermediaries and how we can challenge um, risk aversion in these conversations. Um, and for me, it really means how are intermediaries centering community partners in these conversations? And when I say commu centering community partners, it means really listening to the challenges that community partners like Reggie's organization brings to us and designing around those, those problems and those challenges and solving for those challenges and those problems over solving for the challenges and problems that are brought to us by wealth holders. And if we can't reverse that dynamic, if we're not over indexing to, to centering the challenges and, and problems that our community partners have, then we will continue to be stuck in this, in this power dynamic loop of, of, of centering wealth holders rather than our community partners. And then the other way that I think that, that intermediaries can really step up in this, in this challenge of, of, of risk is to really walk the walk. Demonstrate to funders how you do this work. How do you fund and move capital and design programming alongside community partners in a way that centers racial equity throughout, throughout all of it, from the funding decisions to the design pro program design to the outcomes that we seek how are we continuing to lift up and demonstrate how we are integrating that throughout all of our work? Because really at the end of the day, you know, like if we can't, as, as Jennifer said earlier, if we can't name the problem, we can't design for the solution. So intermediaries can really step into the space as a, uh, a model of how to do this work to bring funders along and bring us to, the, to a point where we can actually challenge risk within our institutions, or risk aversion, I should say. I just wanna build on that. Um, there is a huge role right now. It, can you hear me better? I know I was a little quiet before. Is it better? Not better? It's a little better. I'll speak loudly. How about I yell at all of you? I'm going to yell these things. This is how we're going to do it. No, I mean, I do think that there's a really important role for experimentation. As Reggie suggested, a lot of the ways in which we approach some of these issues before, they're not working the same. So we have to think very um, 
inventively, very creatively about how we are, uh, how we are addressing um, power building, how we are helping um, our funder friends see opportunities to reimagine their systems. Um, I, I feel really strongly that the, the work that we support, the folks from the field are really in the best position to help us understand what works, what doesn't. And I, our role as intermediaries is to help communicate that back um, and make sure that those folks who are um, in positional power can hear that and understand the um, understand the consequences of those actions. I think there's also a really important role in doing what Common Future has done as part of this, um, which is building relational infrastructure, helping people who are doing frontline work get connected with each other so that the learning um, that is always happening, the knowledge, the relationships are all getting shared and that is one of, I feel like, our very best and um, longest term impacts that we can leave as funders for this for this amazing um, future that we that is being lived um, in. Um, yeah, within communities that often are um, the the most extracted and the most marginalized. So. Um, yeah, there's an important role for experimentation and making sure that um, th the lessons that uh, folks are learning are shared in ways that um, can forward the movement. Yeah, and Kate, I wanted to also just bring in um, an example that you, you brought to us earlier um, around the funder manifesto. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more around like how, how to, how could, Fund practitioners, intermediaries, and funders kind of shift that power dynamic through something like that. Yeah, the funder manifesto um, comes from our friends over at Runway, and it was really born out of their um, experiences with funders who sometimes come and want to engage with them, but are not may be ready to actually engage with them in the way that centers their power. And they have created sort of a due diligence process for funders. I know oftentimes we experience due diligence processes um, from philanthropy. And um, it was, it, it's just a really, um, it's a really beautiful, very meaningful and something that we're hearing from the field um, an increasing desire to be able to have that kind of, well, you have your own criteria. We have our criteria too. And it's important that you show up in certain ways to make sure that um, we're actually in a mutual relationship. And this is not just like you to us, but it really is um, an opportunity to revisit those positional dynamics. May I add, may I add something? I, I think fundamentally, and I agree with everything that's been said so far, but really to make it as plain as possible and as simple as possible, I think the question is, to all of us who are interested in social impact, do you care enough about the people most directly impacted to do something about it? And if you do, what is it that you need to do? Have, are the strategies that you've employed in the past still working or are they not working? And if there are not, what strategies should you now employ, right? And move away from risk aversion. Perhaps easier said than done, but absolutely essential. If at the end of the day, you want to be able to answer the question, yeah, of course I care about the people who are most directly impacted. And this is what I did. This is how I changed. This is how I stepped up. This is how I acted boldly. This is how I stepped outside of my comfort zone to do the thing that was required to be done. Whew, all right. 
I feel like in the responses to that question, each of you really leaning into, we have to redefine how we see ourselves and how we move and work and think about problems and think about solutions and how we even engage each other. So absolutely right on. Um, let's zoom out a little bit. Um, in our roundtable discussions, we heard that there's a need to coordinate under a bigger tent, right? For us to align on an agenda where we're able to push back against racial backlash and develop an offensive strategy. So do you agree? What top one to three points of alignment um, do you think an agenda should include if you do? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in first, um, give Reggie a break from, from leading us every single time. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I do agree that we do need a, a more coordinated approach and um, an offensive approach. And I think what it needs is a, is a really compelling vision as well. Um, because without that compelling vision, it just feels like we're pushing a boulder up the hill um, instead of kind of really moving with ease, um, moving with ease towards this vision that we all hold for each other. Um, so in terms of alignment, I think I can offer a couple things. The first is um, an organizing principle or value that, that this coalition or this collaborative can hold. Um, and that would be something that just really states the facts from a place of power, from a place of like, there's not, this is, is there's no alternative to this. There's no other history around this. And, and really what that could look like is, you know, racism is embedded in all of our systems and is actively present in practices we have today. In order to address those inequalities and inequities that we see in our economy, we have to approach it with first, a nuanced understanding of how racial capitalism has created these inequities. And then second, move and design and fund uh, solutions that center challenges that seek to, to that seek outcomes that really uh, increase racial equity. So if we have this value and this organizing principle that stands from a place of power, like this is actually what's happening and we have the solutions. I think that can be something so powerful and galvanizing to really um, move people towards from a place of like defensiveness where we're like, no, but this work should be done. And like, do you remember like all of the wealth gap and like, people who are doing this work or actually know this, it, it, we don't, we have to stop having that conversation because we know these things to be true. We know that people who are closest to the challenges have the solutions. We know that we have to move funding to them. We know that historically we haven't moved funding to them. And that is because of racial capitalism and racism in our country. So really kind of that organizing principle is one thing that I think that I would offer to, to build alignment. The second really is a call to practice um, and really starting from that, that visionary place of, of, you know, in order to realize a vision of a just and equitable world where all people can thrive and access basic needs, we need to ensure that racial equity is an outcome of all of the solutions that we are designing and funding to address inequality. Racial equity and racial justice cannot be a program area. It's just not like one thing that we fund on the side, just like DEI is not one thing that we do on the side. Like we have to really think about embedding racial equity throughout everything and that being an organizing principle for us to start, to start on. And not to say like, oh yeah, we can bring racial equity along and sit, can sit alongside our other programmings because as Jennifer pointed out earlier, gender justice is racial justice, economic justice is racial justice, climate justice is racial justice. All of these things, all of the inequalities that we see when we look to the root causes, it is because racial capital of racial capitalism in our society. And really kind of starting from there as those are the building blocks, which we 
organize above and beyond towards. Those would be what I would offer. I mean, I can, I can all, y'all, I can always chime in. <laughs> so let me not repeat any of the great things that we just heard, because I completely agree with them. But for, for some reason, what's jumping out at me is uh, alignment, the alignment piece. And what I think that entails is also something that the very wise Jennifer said in her remarks, which is this focus on community. I think racialized capitalism and all, and just some the way that some of these systems are are set up foster competition. We need to be in community rather than competition. That's how we get aligned. We need to leave our egos at the door and enter from a place of humility. At least that's how I think we should do it, right? Because community isn't about the one person. It's about really all of us. And I think as human beings, we need community. Like I certainly am humble enough to know that I don't have all the answers. Like I get invigorated and energized and become more creative when I'm in community when we're working on problems together, problems that we have identified or that have been thrust upon us to solve in any case, right? I feel much more confident when I think that we've vetted those issues and challenges amongst a, a room of committed, knowledgeable, smart people. So how to be in community is a thing too, right? Um, with respect to uh, alignment. Um, and then I also think that racialized capitalism often has, certainly me, but many of us kind of running around as if like our heads were cut off, like always out of time, always on having to do X, Y, Z, like not enough time. We need to make the time. We need to take a deep breath <laughs> and make the time to really do thoughtful, strategic work. Because I'm going to tell you, I certainly feel that those on the quote unquote other side are not running around like, you know, they don't have a head on their shoulders, right? They are certainly making the time to do the work they think they need to do to create the world they want to create, which I think is antithetical to the world that all of us want to create. So we need to, as Jennifer also said, we need to reclaim the narrative. We need to reclaim how we do this work. We need to figure out the best, most, most healthy ways to show up collectively. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think to your earlier point, Reggie, we have to, we have to redefine what, what wins mean and how we mark those. Because what we're really trying to do is build a world that doesn't exist. <clears throat> And when you're working to build a world that doesn't exist and where the systems are designed to divide um, and not for us to have alignment, to find attunement with each other, um, it is easy to feel discouraged um, when you don't make as much progress on a particular issue as you hoped. Um, but it's, it's really important that built into um, the agenda is a, a way for us to, to mark those moments where we can recognize how we're making progress. And progress is one of those wonderful snowball on the mountaintop things that can really roll. And as you feel like, oh yeah, and I'm, I'm in it, but Reggie is in it and Sandy is in it. We're all in it and we're all working. Um, we have moments where we can pause um, and Racial, racialized capitalism does not want us to pause, um, but where we can really pause and say, we're doing this and we can get ourselves refueled because this is not a short term fight as was mentioned in the comments, right? This is something that we have been, um, this is something that we have had to fight for decades, if not centuries. So like, let's just go ahead and say, this is gonna be a long fight. And we have to um, we have to stay fueled for it in order to um, in order to have the kind of world that is possible.
Thanks, y'all. Um, and before we move into our last facilitated question, if folks want to pop questions in the Q&A, because after this, we'll be opening up um, to uh, other folks' questions. Um, all right. So zooming out yet again. Um, yes, this conversation is grounded in sort of the backlash we've been seeing this year, but we also know backlash is not new right? That there are oftentimes winds, blowback, winds, blowback, stalling, you know? So how do we move from just responding to the moment to think about an offensive strategy, um, one that will enable our work in the future? What can we learn from this moment and others to take forward? And what do we want to leave behind? Yeah, I, um, Thank you for this question, Allison. Um, I think what I would really uh, continue to harp on is this, this notion of power dynamics in this conversation between um, practitioners, intermediaries, and funders. Um, so I think first, we, we really need to acknowledge the power dynamics that do exist in that conversation. Um, and acknowledge that these power dynamics have really just kept us in a loop and have kept us um, dependent on uh, really kind of advancing racial progress at the speed of those who hold power and money rather than advancing racial progress at the speed of those who are experiencing racism in our in our country today. And so those power dynamics are really kind of what hold us back and keep us in this looped conversation. Um, and so I think without acknowledging, first acknowledging those power dynamics when we enter a conversation, trying to build co coalition and, and collaboration between um, practitioners, intermediaries and funders, like we cannot move forward. The second, um, the second thing after we've been able to acknowledge that and, and rec reconciled with the fact that like we are moving at the pace of which money is dispersed to us, the, the pace at which is comfortable for wealth holders, honestly, um, then we really need to work earnestly and actively to change those power dynamics and to restructure those power dynamics to ensure that people closest to the challenges have power to dictate resource flows. They have power to dictate the pace of change and that they also have power to dictate the narratives that we use around these conversations. And I really, I, I fundamentally believe without this restructured that, that we, we can't have a different conversation. We will just be stuck in the same conversation because backlash is inevitable. Backlashes are inevitable. Um, and it really, the progress that, that we are able to make in between and in spite of the backlash doesn't need to be held back by fears of what may happen or what could happen if we, if we make progress or if we do something, if we move money to community, if we if we give power to community to make decisions, like we we the progress that we make cannot be held back by these fears of what what, what could happen. Without taking risks, we can't build the future that we want. We will not be able to build the future that we want at the pace that we want to build it. And we won't be able to realize a future where race is not a determination of your survival in this economy. So really like without shifting these power dynamics, acknowledging them, changing them and taking risks by, by changing them, we can't have a different conversation. Um, I, I would add said most of what I would have even thought about saying. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, I would add that even the way you frame this question itself as a gift, right? Because that framing acknowledges the very important historical perspective that 
and this is my own tweaking of that and my description of what that historical perspective is from my vantage point and my experience, which is at any time Black folks have achieved economic, political, or social progress, it has been met with backlash. It's historical. It's always happened. Um, the Civil War, followed by Reconstruction, followed by the new Jim Crow. I mean, followed by Jim Crow, then the Civil Rights Act, and then the new Jim Crow, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, the summer of 2020, anti-DEI, anti-CRT that we're experiencing as we speak. So knowing that whatever progress we will make, we'll be bound to meet with some backlash, I think is, is, important, is an important thing to acknowledge and understand. But it also is liberating. And really we should always be talking about liberation, right? Because we, the, the other thing that we know is that if we can predict backlash will happen, we can also predict that it will not last forever, right? So that frees us up and liberates us to think creatively about what we need to do to create the world that we want. Because this moment isn't going to last forever. That needs to be what, what part of the conversation is. And the other thing is that inaction is a privilege that not everybody has, right? Um, I certainly know, again, historically, that folks had far less resources at their disposal, and they did some important shit <laughs> anyway, right? And so in this moment where things feel really challenging, think about all that we do have at our fingertips to help us do this work. And we do now have the benefit of this historical perspective about backlash, which again is that it sucks right now, but it's not going to last forever. And how do we prepare when the moment presents itself again to be ready, to seize that opportunity, to do the things we need to do when the moment inevitably, inevitably presents itself and the opportunity inevitably presents itself again. We need to be ready when that happens. That was a mic drop. There's nothing for me to say after that. I'm done. Thanks, y'all. Um, yeah, uh, so we can now move into Q&A. Um, remember to keep those questions coming in or you can just pop them in the chat. Um, but to kick it off, just again, uh, zooming out once again, Reggie ending on looking at the future. Many of us are thinking about the upcoming election. Right. And this is not just for you, Reggie. I'm just saying the way that you framed it. I don't want to put the pressure on you. Um, what do we need to be thinking about before the election? What should we be planning for after the election, especially given what we were just talking about, about looking at the past to think about the future? I Maybe I should start this one. <laughs> so, I, you know, I would just say uh, it is important for us to organize and put together an enduring agenda, regardless, regardless of um, any particular electoral outcome. We see things like Project 2025. Um, those are not dependent on a presidential position. Though that They are proposing an, a whole set of enduring policies. And so we need to um, it, you know, sometimes moments come up that really galvanize. This might, this seems to be a moment for us to galvanize and say, we're ready. We uh, have a shared analysis. We are planning together. We each have roles that we can play. And to, to um, take, take the time to plan not just for a few years, but really for the um, for many more years uh, to create system systemic change, which is what we need to do. And um, you know the power the power that exists currently, right? Power that is upholding white supremacy 
does not want to give up its power. Like it's not ready to sit down with us and negotiate. It, it wants to stay in power. So the only way to address that and unseat it is to have that vision, to have a real compelling um, case that we are making and to do it together and to have it last for more than just an election cycle. Here, here, right, and 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 watch the Olympics. Now I'm serious. Like I'm, I, I'm a poli sci major. I'm a poli sci major. I thought I needed to, to major in poli sci before I went to law school. <laughs> Little, I mean, I didn't have to, but I didn't know that. I'm a poli sci major, and even so, I have to take a break from all the the politics, right? Like I have to be dist actively distracted from some of the reality of what every four years especially brings in our country, but the increased polarization itself. Um, and sometimes I, I think Vanessa's comment in the chat is like sometimes those least impacted need to step up and do more of the work, right? Because the exhaustion is real and we need to engage in self care and we need to take care of ourselves, particularly those of us who are practitioners and have the responsibility of so many other people resting on our shoulders, our constituents, our stakeholders, our staff members, right? All feel the impact of this moment. And we are responsible to some degree or another for their well being. And so we need to take care of ourselves. And so for me, every four years, like I'm like, I'm wedded to the Olympics. I love watching it. Like I, I'm taking my walks, I'm listening to my podcast, all of those things until. I can't anymore. Like the moment is going to come when I'm act when I actively need to be engaged in the politics uh, that are happening. But I don't think there's anything wrong with keeping that at bay and taking care of yourself for as long as you can. But then showing up and being fully engaged um, when when the moment requires us to do that. And so, to your point, Kate, we always need to be prepared whatever the situation is. And so, um, yeah, hope for the best, right? But always be prepared for the worst. Yeah, I um, love what both Kate and Reggie shared. Uh, I think, you know, self-care, absolutely very real. Um, the highs feel very high, the lows feel very low. So also building a place building from a place of like stability is, is really important. Um, I think for me, for me and from the position of, of uh, being an intermediary that doesn't necessarily focus directly on the elections or election cycles and just kind of thinking about um, the work that we are advocating for and we are doing focused on racial justice and, and racial equity, you know, Kate mentioned this work is long-term. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of like positive momentum right now that, that should fuel us, that we, that should fuel us to keep doing the work that we are primed to do and know that our, our partners who are primed to do the election work are also receiving that fuel. And how do we support them to keep doing their work, but also know that our work is, is long-term, our work has a specific arc, our work has specific lane. And, and knowing that like doing something specific for the election doesn't necessarily mean me as an organization doing something, but me as an individual also like pumping up the people who are, who are doing something for the election. How do I support them? Um, and how do I support those initiatives? Uh, but as an organization, no, like, here's my North Star. Here's where I'm trying to go. I know this work around racial justice is here for the long term. How do I keep bringing up the solutions that are working, lifting them up to you so you can make the case for people who are voting to write vote for the things that that will really pro provide for our communities. So I think there's a there's a 
a lane for us to kind of try to 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 stay within, but also know that the momentum can be contagious. And how do we how do we channel that momentum in a way that is actually most useful for ourselves as an organization and also ourselves con uh, connected to other organizations in our ecosystem? Uh, we have a couple of great questions that have come in, so I'm going to just keep rolling with those. If we see the necessity of combating the opposing sides coordinated of state-to-state -state attack, state-to-state -state attack, what are your thoughts about creating language that connects better to a non-academic audience? I understand there is too much time spent messaging language to appeal to funders. If the core of the issue for funders is what they feel is the general opinions of the population, is that the best time to spend? Uh, is that the best way to spend understanding how to best appeal to every audience? So what are your thoughts about that? I mean, I wish the funders were moved by mass opinion, um, but that, that really doesn't seem to be the case. But with that said, 100% agree. The language that we use to talk about the work, to talk about the world building that's happening should be accessible and should be, should be shared. And I know that there um, there are some efforts, grassroots efforts to think about how language is shared um, and how the, the systems, you know, sometimes when people hear economic system, their first feeling isn't, oh, yay, or wow, trust, you know, but we've, we really have to do something about that because there are economic systems that are based on trust that do exist. Um, and we need to find ways to share and highlight those efforts so that people know that there are other models that they could, uh, they could take inspiration from and bring back and adapt for their own community. So yes, I'm, it isn't the, probably the best use of time um, trying to massage language for, for funders, but here we are. Um, and uh, it is important for us to think about how we help people understand what is happening in their own communities so that they can understand, celebrate, and participate um, in that kind of economic system. Yeah, the only thing that I would add is, is just to go back to what I shared earlier in terms of power dynamics <clears throat> and how we can flip those to make sure that people who are closest to the challenges are in charge of the narratives. Like that is part of like the language piece. Like how do we make sure that the language that is being used is actually language that that our community partners and our communities are actually are actually using, um, because it every layer becomes abstracted even between community partners and intermediary. Like the word intermediary itself is an abstraction. Like it's, you know, there's there it becomes more and more distant and more and more um, uh, uh, abstract as we step away from from the the actual challenges. Um, so I think, yes, we should spend more time speaking in a language that, that most people can understand. And I, for one, am guilty of not doing that. So also just like invite that challenge um, and was listening to a podcast earlier today, who just said like this, the theme in the 2016 election was the, the economy is rigged and people really re resonated with that. 75% of the of the population said, yes, I believe the economy is rigged. So how do we get kind of return to that like notion of like, there are words that we can use that really resonate with our communities that really, that are powerful. Yeah, and I think Kate and Sandia really hit the nail on the head. And the only thing that I would add is that so little of this is by happenstance and so much of it is intentional and language is intentional. And language is intended sometimes to be exclusive, to keep people out. And so we need to decolonialize philanthropy uh, and the language that um, that it um, trades upon, frankly, because it, as in many other institutions, keeps people out. It keeps people out. And if we're keeping people out, then we're really never really going to be able to hear right? Those who have the best ideas 
to solve the problems because we're creating these language and other barriers that get in the way. So let's de decolonialize all of it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and oddly enough, I think this might be our last question before we begin to wrap up. Um, but this question is actually for the panelists and attendees. Um, are there examples of effective strategies, tools, interventions that have brought white wealth holders around to this urgency and need in terms of behavior change and actually moving more money and yielding power? Um, I guess I would, I would offer um, our friends over at the Solidaire Network, um, which is a network of high net worth individuals and um, institutional partners that are focused on supporting the solidarity economy. And um, it has been really beautiful to be part of that network where we happen to be an institutional member and there's a listserv that people actually communicate on about opportunities that are coming up um, and times when folks have said things that have been difficult to hear. There's a, a way of processing, um, but they've been really effective at creating points of connection among a lot of different kinds of donors and moving money relatively quickly to um, to frontline organizations without a lot of hoops to jump through. So Solidair Network is is an example and it's I'd love to say I can think of a lot of other examples, but but that one in particular has been a very rich community to be part of, no pun intended. Yeah, the other the others that I would offer um, are also justice funders as a as a group that that work does a lot of work to support and and align uh, phil philanthropic organizations around a just transition um, and and funding a just transition, um, which includes um, funding racial equity work. Um, and I think that there's there's also um, resource generation, which is a is a is a group that works with um, organiz uh, not organizations individuals who are are um, uh, who are younger and and have been born into wealth and and really trying to harness them and and move them to uh, to a place of where they want to see their money being used in a in a non extractive way. Um, and then also the third one that I would lift up um, is, is Cordata Capital, which works with wealth, wealth holders to really, um, and puts them through cohorts to really unlearn a lot of the things that we've learned in terms of risk and reward and how we, how our, our notions of like, how do we, how our money should make more money and how we should actually perceive um, where our money, where, where our money is actually doing its work. Um, and so they are a great group that has worked with, with funders and, you know, the work is, is, is they are all connected. The work is not uh, siloed, um, but really, you know, it is, it does take a lot of efforts across many different uh, cohorts and groups to, to really move people. Uh, not, not one message is gonna speak to, to all people, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you all for those for those thoughts. Um, so we have about five minutes left, and I think it's a great opportunity for folks to share any final words, thoughts, and, and any other commentary that might come in in the chat. We can certainly uplift those. But really, what are your final thoughts based on this conversation and looking ahead? And is there an action step that people can take after leaving this webinar? Reggie, you're unmuted. Do you want to go first or lead us off? Um, yeah, 
I was going to comment on that last question, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to leave it on that hopeful note. Um, <laughs> and so maybe I'll try to end on a hopeful note as well. Um, and so, and, uh, and so I think I'll speak in terms of I think hope is essential. It's a discipline and it's a practice. Um, and so I'll talk about what is giving me hope in this fraught moment, I suppose. Um, and I already talked about these things, so maybe I'm just kind of summarizing what I spoke of earlier. But it really does give me hope to know that this this too shall pass. This moment shall pass. We won't be here forever. And that that historical perspective that I talked about before, um, that uh, that we need to be fighting in this moment, even if we don't feel like our our efforts are are meeting with the success that we have had in the past or would want, um, even holding the line um, and redefining what victory is is important so that when the opportunity presents itself again, we're ready. And we're starting from this point rather than way back there, right? So that matters too. Um, I would say that um, also giving me hope are really conversations like today, like being in this community. So much is about relationships. Uh, and this is a community, right? Um, and and that, we can't, that we can't do it alone. Um, and then uh, having transparent conversations with with staff, with board members, with fellow leaders, um, though that gives me hope too to know that we're not alone. Um, and then also the final thing that has given me hope um, is related kind of to the election kind of thing, which is um, some outcomes in national elections in other places, um, some place, some some countries in Europe and and, and Mexico, for example, some of those national. Um, election outcomes um, are giving me a little bit of hope. Um, I feel energized. I think people are actually in a place where they want to have some conversations about systems change and not just slight adjustments about how we can make the current system work better for us. So it does feel like there's the potential for longer term and meaningful change so that the next generation or maybe the generation after that does not have to have this conversation um, again. And that is something that will happen if we are together doing this work, uh, not allowing ourselves to be distracted and following down the rabbit holes that um, the powers that want to maintain the current systems um, want to want to lead us into and realizing that there is power in this work together. So yeah, I'm, I don't know. I mean, I'm feeling it is it is scary, but it's also, I think, energizing. Yeah, okay, I'm done. Thanks. Thanks, Reggie and Kate. Um, two, two action steps I hope that people take, um, no matter who you are, out of this call. First, if you're a funder and you're trying to make the case in your institution that racial equity needs to be embedded throughout all of your program strategies, please bring in your intermediaries. Please bring in your funders, your um, practitioners into that conversation help them dictate the terms of how that needs to look because that can be that can be a power shift right there. Um, so that's one action. Uh, another action that I would just uplift is if you're a practitioner and you're feeling and an intermediary and you're feeling frustrated, there are tools out here. There is that, that funder manifesto. We, Common Future has our equity commitments. How do we band around those together to ask for something bigger? Um, I really want to invite everyone into this conversation to fight for something bigger and better for our work, because that's what we need in this moment. And as a final word, just really thank you to Allison for moderating, Reggie, Kate, for your time, everyone who joined this conversation. Thank you so much for your time and participating in this conversation. Jennifer and Jess for sharing these beautiful takeaways from our conversation and Joe um, for, for kicking us off today. This is an important conversation. 
I hope that it continues. I hope that we continue to be in this in this fight together. Uh, and I hope that we can continue to see some material wins for our work. So thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. Everyone. It was an honor to be here. Yeah.